happened in 1999. Muhammad Ali Center opens in 2005, downtown Louisville. 2007 in June in Meredith versus Louisville, the U.S. Supreme Court rules that Jefferson County School desegregation plan is unconstitutional. So 1975 was the white racist riots, the white supremacist riots. Uh, There's a mini civil war, and that's 1975, and now it's 2007. So 75, 25 plus 7 is 32 years. So for 32 years, uh, there was an, and it ordered for the black and white kids to integrate and to uh, take the white kids to the black schools and the black kids to the white schools and just have a lottery that just, you know, a random lottery that chooses where they go. Uh, but in 2007, they said that they can't use race as a determinant. They can use economic factors and other things. Uh, other things. So now they're not even using race as a factor in terms of where kids go to school. 2008, the Shawnee Weed and Seed Program proposed by the Metro Councilwoman Sherry Bryant, Bryant Hamilton to attack crime and rebuild community in West Louisville is funded. So the Shawnee Weed and Seed Program proposed by uh, Metro Councilwoman Sherry Sherry Bryant Hamilton. 2011 Freedom Park between 2nd and 3rd on Cardinal Boulevard is dedicated at the University of Louisville. The park celebrates the struggle for freedom since the settlement of Kentucky. Two Centuries of Black Louisville, a photographic history co-authored by Mervyn Albibspin, Kenneth Clay, and J. Blaine Hudson is published. And that's the, that's the end of the timeline. There's a couple of sections I want to read <laughs> in here. Uh, there's a part about Muhammad Ali on page 180. And Louisville Central High School produced perhaps the best known and most influential athlete in U.S. history, Muhammad Ali. Born Cassius Marcellus Clay on January 17, 1942, he began his boxing career in 1954, and by 1960, he had fought in 167 amateur bouts, winning 161 of them. His victories include the championships of the AAU, the Kentucky National Golden Globe Gloves Tournaments in 1960. Muhammad Ali won the Olympic gold medal as a light heavyweight, and after turning professional, won the heavyweight championship of the world by defeating Sonny Liston on February 25th. 1964, cocky and outspoken. Muhammad Ali was always controversial. It became even more so when he joined the Nation of Islam after he beat the first Sonny Liston in the first Liston fight. In 1967, Ali's opposition to the Vietnam War and his refusal to allow himself to be drafted into the military resulted in the loss of his tide. Ali did not fight again until October 26, 1970, but regained his heavyweight title when he defeated George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle in Zaire, Africa, October 30th, 1974. Muhammad Ali lost and regained his title again, finally retiring in 1981 with a 56-5 career record with 37 knockouts. Lyman Johnson led the NAACP Youth Council and sit-ins in downtown Louisville. It was early 1956. And uh, the, the drug stores. Members of the Youth Council protested segregation at the Brown Theater in 1959. The, uh, the enactment Oh uh, yeah, once more, more direct action and chosen strategy on March 5th. March 5th, 1964 is when Martin Luther King uh, had a march on Frankfurt. And it brought 10,000 supporters to the Capitol. It had speeches by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Jackie Robinson. So in 1964, on March 5th, Jackie Robinson and Dr. Martin Luther King was in Frankfurt. Here's a picture of it. Martin Luther King, Jackie Robinson. Both of them spoke out of Jackie Robinson was in this or not. Um, however, the only the enactment of a Federal Civil Rights Act in 1964 and Louisville's anti-discrimination ordinance in February 1965 added significant weight to the Civil Rights Act and other demonstrations, and then they eventually brought it to enactment in 1966. 
The Kentucky Civil Rights Act is passed in 1966. And this act, which Dr. K uh, Dr. Martin Luther King considered the strongest state civil rights law in the nation, and it represented the culmination and the last significant victory of the civil rights movement in Kentucky. So it's the culmination, it's the pinnacle, and it was the last thing, um, the, the last thing with civil rights that happened in Kentucky, last major thing. The passage of the Civil Rights Act. May Street Kidd, she died in 1999, born in 1904, represented the 41st district in the Kentucky House from 1968 to 1984. Highlights of her long legislative career, including the sponsorship of a resolution for Kentucky to ratify more than a century after the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment Constitution, uh, amendments to the U.S. Constitution of legislation providing funds for low-income housing. So, uh, during the 60s, 70s, or 80s, she passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Since Kentucky had not passed 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, the Civil War amendments after they were passed um, in the 1800s. So, in the 1900s, in the middle of the 1900s, they had to pass them. In 1968, Georgia Davis Powers became the first woman and first African American elected to the Kentucky Senate where she served until 1989. So 1968 was when we had the first African American uh, elected senator. And it was a woman too, so the first woman and first uh, black woman and first black person that was elected to uh, the Kentucky Senate. And then they said Gerald Neal seceding Georgia Power, so I don't know if Gerald Neal's the second one afterwards. I don't know. Shortly after her election, Georgia Davis Powers introduced a fair housing bill. So housing, housing is a big theme. Representatives May Street Kidd and Hughes McGill introduced a similar bill in the House. The bill passed, making Kentucky the first state in the South to enact a fair housing law. So again, there's another success. Kentucky is the first state in the South to enact a fair housing law. So I guess 60s or 70s. On May 27th, 1968, there was a massive demonstration that was held at 28th and Greenwood to protest an incident involving alleged police brutality a few weeks earlier. So May 27th, 1968. Speaking from the roofs of automobiles parked at the intersection, a number of young activists criticized police actions toward black citizens. So here's some pictures. I think that's the author of the book, Mervyn Albuspin on the right. He was one of the co-authors of the book. It says that he was an artist at the Courier Journal. He's at the corner minutes before civil disruptance happened. Here's this man with his fist in the air and he's like, yeah, we need, we need change. We need some change now. James Cortez. That's James Cortez and Sam Watkins, the Black Unity League, Black Unity League of Kentucky at a rally at 28th and Greenwood. Okay. So, speaking from the roofs of automobiles, criticized police actions towards the black citizens. They were also talking about Stokely Carmichael. Uh, he was a known national figure that he was in route, but they were saying local officials were preventing him, uh, preventing his flight to land in Louisville. As the rally was ending, the sound of a bottle breaking. There was a bottle that broke, and it was mistaken for a gunshot. And then chaos just erupted. The police already stationed nearby arrived in minutes, prompting, prompting a major confrontation between them and the angry crowd. Over the next few days, a major urban riot engulfed much of West Louisville. Two young African Americans died, 472 were arrested, millions of dollars in property was destroyed, and the community was haunted by searing images of police and the National Guard units patrolling local streets. One of the key eyewitnesses was Mervyn Al Albspin. All be spin, all be, all been spin, all bins. Ah, oh, God. Then an artist at the Courier Journal, aware that a rally would be held at 28th and Greenwood, Greenwood, all the spin suggested that the newspaper assign someone to report on it. The editors chose a white reporter. It employed no black reporters at the time. The Courier Journal, who was founded by Henry Watterson, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, bloodthirsty maniac, the genocidal maniac, uh, rode with Nathan Bedford Forrest. So the Courier Journal. Not surprisingly, had no black reporters. 
1968 on their staff and they suggested that Alba Spin accompany him. When they arrived, Alba Spin feared for the safety of the reporter and sent him back to the newspaper. Then along with two black freelance photographers, J. Vernon Thomas and Eddie Davis, Alba Spin spent the next 48 hours covering the city's worst civil disorder since Bloody Monday in 1855. Eddie Davis, a free black, two black freelance photographers, J. Vernon Thomas and Eddie Davis. So 1968 was a black power riot and the black power riot was the first biggest uh, disturbance in Louisville since the Bloody Monday riots in 1855. And the Bloody Monday riots in 1855, um, that was when the Germans, the Germans had, uh, the Germans and Irish Catholics were coming into Louisville and mass route and the wasp protestants were pissed off at them so on election day they know nothing the national the nationalist party who or the nativist party who was said that the germans and the irish weren't white enough attacked them in butcher town um on the east end and then attacked the germans in the butcher town and attacked the irish in the west end so that was bloody monday in 1855 fast forward 100 and uh, 13 years later is the first biggest uh, civil disturbance and you saw there's early in the writing the crowd at 28th and Greedwood overturned and burned a police detective's vehicle so they flipped over that uh, police detective's vehicle the riot became a turning point in Alba Spin's career afterward the newspaper sent him to Columbia University to study journalism and he spent the next 34 years at the Kerr Journal as a reporter and editor in the aftermath, six African Americans, James Cortez, Manfred Reed, Samuel Hawkins, Robert Kuyu Sims, Ruth Bryant, and Walter T. Pete Cosby were arrested for conspiring to blow up the oil refineries in West Louisville. So after the 68 riots, and these six guys were <laughs> arrested for a conspiracy to blow up some oil refinery. They were dubbed the Black Six. They were tried and acquitted in July 7, 1970 after one of the city's more memorable show trials. So it was like uh, a Stalin's show trials. Following the disturbances, many businesses and residents moved out of the neighborhood. Forty years later, the area remained one of the most neglected and economically depressed in the city. Along with the turmoil in the streets of Black Louisville, there was considerable racial tension at the University of Louisville. There was, uh, as on college campuses throughout the nation, a black student union, BSU, was organized in 1967. By 1968, this group was providing tutoring programs in the West End, published a newsletter, and developing a comprehensive set of demands intended to transform the university itself. These demands were presented to the administration on March 4th, 1968, leading to several weeks of inconclusive negotiations with President Woodrow M. Strickler. The police stand outside the corner of Jazz at 28th and Greenwood, May 1968, owned by Ken Clay. It was Louisville's first black culture shop. 202, 202, page 202. Though Strickler was willing to accede to several demands, including the creation of an Office of Black Affairs, negotiations broke down over the question over who would head that office. This prompted a BSU takeover of Strickler's office on April 30th, 1969. So they took over the dean's office, or the president, President Woodrow M. Strickler. He was a Strickler for the rules, right? Woodrow Strickler. Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow was a racist. Woodrow Wilson was, and I don't know about Woodrow Strickler. The three-hour standoff ended after Woodrow Strickler met with the students and rejected their demands but granted them amnesty. Undeterred, on May 1st, 1969, members of the BSU and some community supporters seized the building which housed the office of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. So they took over his office one day and then they, uh, uh, Strickler met with the students and rejected their demands but granted amnesty, say it was okay, but then the next day, uh, they seized the building that housed the office of the Dean of the College of Arts and Students. Nine BSU members were arrested and subsequently dismissed from the university. So nine students were uh, suspended from the university. So nine people lost their you know, educational opportunities. In the wake of these events, the university established the Office of Black uh, Affairs, created more than 100 new scholarships for black students and began offering the first black studies courses, which led to the formal establishment of the Department of Pan-African Studies, PAS, in 1973. One of the student protesters was Gerald A. Neal, which would later become an attorney and he would be elected to the Kentucky Senate in 1988.